Thank you so much, Chat. Let me go ahead and share my screen with all of you. Um, we kind of really briefly went over things that we're going to be addressing today in this presentation, but just again, um, we'll start off talking about some different functions of behavior and, and why kids behave the way they do. We'll talk about teaching some replacement behaviors, some behaviors that may be more appropriate um, than some behaviors you might currently be seeing. We'll be going over reinforcement and punishment, and if we have time at the end, we'll give you a really brief preview of one of our future um, webinars that go into this topic a little bit deeper in, a, in how to identify what some of these functions are. Um, using data. So, all right. All right. So before we talk about all that, first, we really need to define what behavior is. Um, so behavior is anything that a person does in response to some sort of stimulus. Um, there needs to be an action involved. So an example of a behavior would be eating food. Um, but a non-example would be feeling hungry because feeling hungry isn't necessarily something how you do, it's how you feel, whereas eating food is something that you do. Um, you, behaviors also need to be observable, so you need to be able to see it or hear it occurring. Um, behaviors are also measurable, and there are lots of different ways that you can measure a behavior, um, you can measure it through frequency or how often it occurs. You can measure it through duration, how long it occurs, and you can measure it through intensity. So for example, um, if you take, if screaming is a behavior, you can measure screaming by counting how often a child screams in a single class period or you could do duration and you can record how long the child screams for. Uh, or you can record the intensity of the screaming. Like, is it really loud and shrill or is it less loud? You can record like the number of decibels that a child screams at and that could be your basis for changing it. Um, there's a test that can help you determine if something is a behavior or not too called the dead man's test. It can be really helpful. Um, the idea is if a dead man can do it, it's probably not a behavior. So a student not responding or doing nothing is not a behavior. Behavior is something that you do. Awesome, thank you, Mary. So now that we've kind of established what behavior is, um, there are a few different reasons why we might engage in different behaviors. So we have three main reasons. Um, one of these reasons would be access. So we want to get something. Another reason is escape. We wanna get away from something. Um, and our last reason is an automatic or a sensory uh, motivated behavior, which means that we're doing this to satisfy some sort of sensory need in our body, whether it's because it feels good or because we wanna be aware of our body. So these are our three types of functions of behavior, what motivate our behavior. And so we'll go into these a little bit more detail. So our first one, access. Um, we typically want one of these two things. We either want access to a tangible, um, that can be candy or food or toys, electronics, um, some sort of tangible object or item that we want to have access to, whether to play with, to eat, something along those lines. We may also want access to attention. That could be from my parents, from my teacher, from my peers and my siblings, um, just from other people. So those are two things that when I want to get something, these are the two things that I'm typically wanting to get. When we're trying to escape behaviors, this is typically when we're some sort of demand or some sort of instruction that we're given. Um, this can be homework, this can be chores at home. Um, and it's something that we just don't wanna do. And so we'll, do, we'll engage in some sort of behavior to get away from that demand. Um, we might also try to get away from uncomfortable situations. Some people might really like attention. Other people may be really uncomfortable with attention. And so if they're getting attention, they want to get away from that and they want to escape that. Um, so they'll engage in, in some sort of behavior. They might be uncomfortable with new people or unfamiliar places. And so to get away from those situations, um, they might engage in behavior. 
And lastly, our automatic and sensory. So body awareness. Um, some of our kids, my I know when I am just thinking and, and doing busy work, I'll tap my fingers or I'll tap my foot. Um, and just things like rocking or hand flapping that help people feel more aware of their body. Um, it also could be for sensory input. So for, to feel relief or to feel good, um, like if I have a bug bite and I'm scratching my bug bite, I'm scratching because I want relief from this sensory experience. So those, those are our three functions. We're talking about functions of behavior, what motivates behavior. Those are our three um, that really are what is driving us to engage in certain behaviors. So a few things that we might think are behaviors, but really aren't, kind of how, how Mary explained, things that we can see. So if you're looking for, oh, well, this child engaged in screaming because they wanted to feel um, in control or they wanted to feel powerful or they were angry or because they have autism or ADHD or depression, all of these things are things that we can't see. So they may be factors in what we're feeling, um, but they're not the behavior itself because those aren't things that we can see. Um, those aren't things that, like Mary said, we can observe, we can measure. Um, so these are considered non-examples of what behavior is or what behavior is motivated by. Um, so let Mary jump in. Okay, so now that we know all of that, um, it's important to know why. Do we need to know this? So let's talk about why knowing the function of behavior is important. Uh, knowing the function of a problem behavior is important because it will help you teach a new replacement behavior. It'll help you teach the child a more desirable skill and what you want to see them do. Um, we know that children behave in certain ways, like Ashley said, to get something, to get away from something, or to have some sort of sensory input. So in order to get the child to replace their problem behavior with the more desirable behavior, the replacement behavior, the thing you're teaching must serve the same function as the problem behavior. That's why you need to know the function. Uh, think about it this way. If the replacement behavior doesn't meet the child's needs or serve the same function, then they don't really have an incentive to use it. And they probably won't pick it back up, pick it up. Um, so for an example, if a child runs out of the classroom to escape from work, forcing them to sit in their chair won't serve that function of escape and they might just get up and leave the classroom anyways. You might, that might not work. However, if the child learns how to ask for a break, this is more appropriate than running out of the classroom, asking for a break uh, does serve the function of escaping from work and um, is more appropriate than running out of the classroom. So that would be a good replacement behavior. Um, to ensure that the child will use the replacement behavior, uh, it needs to be something that the child can do or can learn it's within their skill set. Um, this makes sense, right? If they can't do it, they probably won't do it. Um, like we discussed, it needs to serve the same function as the problem behavior. It should also require less effort or the same amount of effort as the problem behavior. So if you think about it, if the replacement behavior is more difficult to do than the problem behavior, the child will be less likely to do it. So we need to try to make it easy. Um, lastly, and probably most importantly, the replacement behavior needs to be rewarded and or reinforced. Um, so if you think about it, if the child isn't rewarded for their behavior, why would they do it? If you weren't getting paid at your job, why would you go? Um, if you reinforce the new replacement behavior, you're teaching the child to continue behaving in that way. And the child will associate that replacement behavior that you want with feeling good. And that's gonna keep them acting in that way that you want them to. Um, so really quick. So here's some examples of replacement behaviors. So a problem behavior may be talking out uh, in class. So the function of talking out might be to get the teacher's attention, while raising your hand could also get the teacher's attention and is more appropriate for school. So that would be the appropriate replacement behavior. Um, another example is uh, crying. When asked to do homework, crying could serve the function of escaping to do homework. Um, 
And a more appropriate behavior, like we talked about earlier, could be asking for a break. This would be more appropriate, a more appropriate way of temporarily getting out of work than crying. Um, so replacement behaviors often need to be taught to the child. And here's a basic step-by-step -step guide for teaching replacement behaviors. Um, first, like we talked about, you need to identify the function. Um, second, you need to choose a re desirable replacement behavior that serves the same function as the problem behavior. Um, third, you need to model the replacement behavior or show the child exactly how you want them to act. Um, this could be sitting them down and telling them explicitly when you leave class, uh, when you want to leave the class, I want you to raise your hand and ask for a break, or I want you to touch this break card uh, instead like this, and you may need to physically show them sometimes. Um, you can also model the replacement behavior when the child is engaging in the problem behavior so you can redirect them. So for example, um, if a child's talking out in the classroom for the teacher's attention, the teacher could model hand raising. They could raise their hand and not call on the student until the student raises their hand. Tip, uh, students will typically catch on to this and go, oh, I need to raise my hand and then receive teacher attention. Um, All right, so Mary talked a little bit about reinforcing behaviors that we want to see. So we wanna spend a good chunk of our presentation talking about reinforcement, um, and what it is, why we should use it. And so reinforcement, what this does is it increases the likelihood that whatever behavior we want to see or that we don't want to see happens again in the future. Um, so reinforcement can be something tangible. It can be an event. It could be something like praise or attention. It's just something that will increase the chances that this behavior, that the child will engage in this behavior again. So why do we use this? Honestly, it's really this phrase, you get what you pay attention to. So if you're paying attention to problem behavior, that problem behavior is more likely to continue. But if you're rewarding appropriate behavior and ignoring problem behavior, the appropriate behavior is the behavior that is more likely to continue. So there are a few different types of reinforcement. There's positive reinforcement, which basically means we're adding something desirable, adding a desirable consequence to increase this likelihood of behavior um, happening again. So this might be a child finishes their homework and they are reinforced by getting time to play um, outside with friends, um, on their electronics, things like that. That's their reward for completing the task that they were assigned. There's also negative reinforcement. And when people hear negative reinforcement, they tend to think, oh, negative means bad. When we're talking about this, we're not necessarily meaning bad. We're not talking about bad reinforcement. Um, basically, negative reinforcement means we're taking away something that somebody that the child doesn't like. And so that increases the likelihood that they'll do it again. So an example of this, because it's kind of confusing. Um, so if you are eating vegetables for dinner and your child hates vegetables and they start screaming every time that they are presented with vegetables. And so you as a parent or as a teacher, take the vegetables away so they don't have to eat them anymore. The child will be more likely to continue screaming the next time that they have to eat vegetables because what they just learned is that if I scream, I don't have to eat vegetables. So because we took away whatever we were asking them to do, that's going to increase the likelihood that they do this again in the future. So there's a, a fun little acronym that we can use as far as how to use reinforcement. It's up here, this I feed AV. Um, so what each of these letters stand for, and we'll go through all of these. The first one is reinforce immediately. Next, we want to reinforce frequently. Be enthusiastic, use eye contact, describe the behavior you want to see, and then some of these added bonus items to make this more um, effective is anticipation and variety. So when, again, we want to reinforce as soon as possible after, after we see this behavior that we are looking for the appropriate behavior, the replacement behavior. Um, because if we are asking a child to engage in some behavior and then they do it and we're like, ah, I'll give you your reward in two hours, that's not gonna be as meaningful. It's not gonna be as effective as if we were to reinforce immediately after um, they engage in the behavior that we wanna see. So we wanna do it as soon as possible after um, the child 
complies with whatever instruction that we gave him or, or, or her and does whatever task we, ha we had presented. Um, as far as when should we use reinforcement or how often should you do this? You have kind of a few different options as far as um, when you can provide these rewards as reinforcement. You can do it every time they follow your instructions. So an example of this could be child hates eating vegetables. So every time they take a bite of vegetables, they get a candy. So every single time. Um, you might switch that up so that they, if they take three bites of vegetables, then they get a candy. So after a specific number of times that they comply with instructions, you might do it after a random amount of time. So they don't know. Sometimes they'll get it after two bites. Sometimes they'll get it after five bites. You just kind of switch it up and, and provide reinforcement at, at more of a random um, instances. You might want to do after periods of time instead of counting um, how many times they comply. So you might do every five minutes. Maybe they are, have a hard time staying on task doing homework. So you're saying, okay, every five minutes, if you're still on task, I'll give you a reinforcement. You might do after a random amount of time. So they don't know when you're gonna pop in and check on them to see if they're still on task. So you might check in on them at five minutes. You might check in on them every two minutes, just kind of random. Um, so these are some kind of examples of when you can use this reinforcement. But again, as our previous slide said, regardless of which you pick, you'd still wanna provide that reinforcement as immediately as possible. And um, the next one, be enthusiastic and make eye contact. So we want to provide physical acknowledgement of appropriate behavior. This can be a high five, a smile, whatever our body language is, we want to convey excitement. Um, so the child feel also feels excited and they'll want to continue um, engaging in this behavior. We also want to use something called behavior specific praise. So what this is, is this is the verbal acknowledgement of appropriate behavior. And there's really two parts of behavior specific praise. The first part is the actual praise word or phrase. So great job. Thank you. Awesome. Um, all of those type phrases. The problem with just using that phrase by itself is it doesn't tell the child what they did well. It doesn't tell them what they did right, what you wanna see again in the future. It's just kind of a general, and it's great. It feels good to hear those things, but it's more effective when we pair it with this next part. That's a description of the behavior that we think is praiseworthy. So thank you for sitting quietly in your chair. So the child knows, okay, next time I sit quietly in my chair, I will be reinforced for that. I will get the teacher's attention. I will get whatever they're looking for. Um, great job finishing your math assignment. So they know once again, that this is the behavior that they have to engage in in order to get that reinforcement. So this is much more effective and much more helpful than just kind of a general praise. Again, that's really great. And we wanna continue doing that, but we can take it one step further um, and, and help this be a little bit more effective and clear for our kids. So they know exactly what behaviors they need to engage in in order to be reinforced. So another way to use reinforcement is this anticipation and variety. Um, so we want to let our child know or even let them decide before completing the task what they'll be working for. Um, so a way to do this is to create a menu of reinforcement options. So you can see this over here on uh, the right side of the screen is this menu of options that a child can choose from. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be this big. You can create this however you want. You can just to offer them two choices, any sort of, um, this can be really helpful in being excited about what they're working for. It helps make sure that the reinforcement is meaningful. Um, if there are cases where um, Mary asked me to do my homework and she's like, if I will give you a chocolate bar when you're done, but I hate chocolate, that reinforcement is not gonna do anything. I'm not gonna be motivated to work for that. So providing choices um, for your child helps them to make to feel excited about what they're working for, to feel motivated for what they're working for. Um, and so one way that you can do that is by creating a sort of, sort of menu um, for things that they can work for. Another way to do that is a mystery reward. So a way to do this is have your list of, of things that you know your child is really excited about, really motivated by, and you can pick one of those rewards and put it in an envelope so it's a mystery, it's a secret, and they don't get to know what's in the envelope until after they've completed the task. Um, and so you have this in a really visible location for your child to see so they know that they are working for this really exciting mystery reward. And then when they complete the task, they get to open the envelope and have the prize. 
Another way we might want to do this is using a mystery spinner. So you can add reinforcement ideas to a spinner and then spin the wheel and whatever it lands on is what your child gets to earn when they've completed their tasks. So you may see these um, at events where they're like prize wheels and you can do that. There are some virtual spinners online um, that you can use and kind of customize. So really quickly, we wanted to create our own. So if you wouldn't mind dropping in the chat box, one thing that you have found is really motivating for your child or for your students. And we are gonna add those to a virtual spinner to see what reward we get to earn. Um, so feel free to drop those in the chat and let us know what works for your child. Perfect, I see some in here already, awesome. Tickles and chocolate. Okay, we're gonna add some of these to our spinner. Can you see my list while I'm typing these in? Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, let's see. We have tickles, we have chocolate, we have singing, stickers, musical toys. Musical toys, perfect. Star charts, watching TV. Getting a red star, almost like a sticker. Perfect. Watching cartoons. All right. Story time. We have a lot of folks dropping in responses, Ashley. No, this is great. I'm going to stop us right here, but keep giving us ideas. I'm just going to add these ones so far. So what we're going to do is apply these changes and this website it's wheeldecide.com is the website, but there are tons of, of them out there. And what this does is this put all of our options on a spinner that we have. And so I can click this and we earned TV time. So this is a fun way for your child to get to decide what they get to work for um, and what they feel excited about. And it's still a mystery and it can be really exciting and really rewarding. So let me flip back over to my presentation and we will continue. So yes, this is an option. There are a ton of similar things online that you can use um, if you feel like this is something that would be fun for your students or for your child. All right, and then lastly, if you want, someone mentioned a sticker chart in our list, which is awesome. That's something that we wanted to throw up here is a really easy way to track behavior and to make sure that you're rewarding your child or your student. Here are some really basic ones that we found on online. Um, you can kind of create these to however is effective for your child um, or your students. And this is just a fun way where they can keep track of stickers so they can see their progress, helps you track their behavior um, and just kind of an option. So that is reinforcement. Now let's jump into punishment. All right, so punishment is the opposite of reinforcement. Uh, punishment decreases the chances or the likelihood of a behavior reoccurring. Mm -hmm. um, and like uh, reinforcement, there's positive punishment and negative punishment. Um, it has the same sort of role. So, Positive punishment is when you add some sort of consequence, some aversive stimulus that the child doesn't like to decrease the likelihood of a behavior occurring again. So an example of this is like what chat brought up of spanking or yelling, but it could also be um, a reprimand or it could be like a thumbs down, anything or yeah, it could be anything that you add to make the likelihood of the problem behavior decrease. Um, there's also negative punishment and it works similarly for, um, it works similarly to reinforcement. So negative punishment is when you take away a desirable stimulus to decrease the likelihood of behavior reoccurring. So an example of this could be taking away privileges. It could be timeout. It could also be, um, ignoring. So you're taking away attention from the student. Um, so for how to use punishment, um, punishment teaches children what not to do, but it doesn't teach them the replacement behaviors that we talked about, like what they need to do instead. So using punishment by itself without teaching and reinforcing a replacement behavior isn't very effective. It may, it won't work. In fact, it can make things worse. Um, so if you only punish and you don't use a replacement behavior and reinforce the replacement behavior, 
it can actually increase problem behaviors later. Um, it could lead to poor quality relationships between you and the child. And it can also lead to lower self-esteem in the child. Um, so, but if we do use punishment, there's a way to use it effectively. So first we need to define appropriate replacement behavior that we want. And we need to use what we talked about earlier is try to choose a replacement behavior that serves the same function. We need to teach the replacement behavior. Again, what we talked about earlier, we need to model the replacement behavior and teach it to the child, sometimes explicitly. Um, we need to reinforce that replacement behavior. We need to increase the likelihood they're gonna use it. And whenever the problem behavior occurs, we need to ignore it or redirect it. Ignoring can be as a form of punishment because you're taking away the attention that they get from their problem behavior. Um, if you punish the child, um, it can be important to explain to them why they're punished and tell them what they need to do instead or what they need to do next time. Um, because you want to make sure that they learn that the problem behavior um, is associated with the punishment. You don't want them to feel like they had an aversive consequence for no reason or for some other reason. Otherwise, the problem behavior may continue. Um, also, it's important to use punishment consistently in order to help the child learn that the problem behavior is the cause of the punishment. Um, it's important to use punishment consistently so that the child isn't randomly reinforced for their problem behavior. Um, so like what Ashley talked about, random reinforcement um, is very powerful and it can be more powerful than fixed reinforcement. So reinforcing every time. So if we aren't consistent with punishment, it can actually make the problem behavior worse because it's being randomly reinforced. They're randomly being rewarded for their um, problem behavior. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. So before we jump into the next few slides, I just want to do a really quick recap of what we've talked about for reinforcement and with punishment. Like Mary said, um, using punishment by itself isn't always very effective. In some cases, it can make things worse. So a great thing to do is when we're ignoring problem behavior, we're also reinforcing that replacement behavior we talked about earlier, using those things in, together um, to help teach our kids the behavior that we want to see in them. So which one is it? Now we know all about functions of behavior. We know uh, how to reinforce appropriate behavior. We know how to ignore problem behavior. So what we're going to do is just do a really quick overview of something called the ABCs of behavior. Um, we are going to be doing another webinar in this series um, in a few weeks, if that's correct, chat, I think is what you mentioned. Um, and so definitely if you're, this is something that you're interested in, check that webinar out as well, because this will go in more detail um, for just these next few slides that we'll go over really briefly. So ABCs of behavior. This is how we figure out which function it is. Sometimes we can look at a behavior and we can guess, say, okay, they seem to be crying because they don't wanna do their homework. But we can use um, these ABCs to really systematically figure out what is the reason they're engaging in um, a certain behavior. So ABCs stand for antecedent behavior and consequence. Um, so the antecedent, what we're looking at is what happened before the behavior. The behavior is whatever behavior we saw. Remember, our behaviors have to be observable and measurable. And the consequence is what happened after. So these are three basic pieces of what we're looking at when we're trying to figure out what is the function of the behavior. So I'll show you kind of really the real basics of how to record ABC data. This is nice because anyone can do this. You can do this with your child at home. You can do this in school. Um, it's something that is just um, really simple and easy to do um, and, and can help you kind of nail down why exactly um, or what exactly is motivating your child's behavior. So want to pay attention to time. Is this happening during a specific time of the day? It might happen in the morning. Um, we also want to know the setting that this is happening in. So maybe um, this child only has a hard time in math class. They have perfect behavior the rest of the day, but every day during math class, um, they engage in some really loud, they're talking very loud, or they're talking out of turn, or they're um, being mean to their neighbor, but this is only happening in one class. So knowing that context helps us kind of narrow down um, some more details about why this behavior is occurring. 
There's also something called setting events. And what these are is just kind of environmental of events that indirectly impact our behavior. Um, so some things that might be examples of this is if I miss breakfast, um, if I don't eat breakfast in the morning, I am so mad all day. I'm just grumpy all day. And so something that someone might say to me might make me angrier than it would have I eaten breakfast and was in a better mood to start my day. Or maybe I didn't get enough sleep. So I'm really tired all day and I don't feel motivated to do anything or I cry when I'm asked to do my homework because I'm just so tired. So these things are different from antecedents in that this isn't what's triggering the behavior, but it can make those situations a little bit more intense because this alters um, kind of my general mood or um, other things that may change how how um, impactful a situation is. If I can add one more thing to that. Um, setting events also alter the value of reinforcers. So example, if you, like Ashley said, if you miss breakfast, then you're hungry. If you're hungry, then the food will be a really powerful reinforcer because you're hungry. If you're full, then food won't be a powerful reinforcer because you don't want it. Um, getting away from a crowded room might be really reinforcing, but if you're cozy and you're happy where you are, then why would you want to escape? So setting events also alter temporarily the reinforcer that you can use. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for adding that, Mary. So really, again, really, really simple. If you want to know more information on how to do this, um, look for our future webinar. But just again, we're looking for that antecedent behavior and consequence, which can help us identify um, our potential function. So here's an example. A child is asked to do their math homework and they start crying and they fall on the floor and they no longer have to do their assignment. So our antecedent, the thing that happened before the crying was that they were asked to do their math homework. The crying itself is the behavior that we saw. And then the math homework being taken away is our consequence. So kind of following this, this line of, of, of events, a reasonable conclusion could be this function of their, this child's behavior is to escape because they've learned that when they cry, they don't have to do their math homework anymore. So here's an example of what a data sheet might look like. Again, really, really simple. Um, just those things that we talked about, our dates, our times, the setting, and then these three A, B, C antecedent behavior consequence. And then we can use that to identify um, a potential function. So it looks like we have a few minutes before we jump into um, answering questions. So what I'm gonna do is show you just a few minutes of this video. And what I want to do is go through and fill out one line of our data sheet with you. Um, so we are gonna just watch a couple of minutes of this. Ashley, can you share your computer sound, please? Yes. Thank you. Just one second. I think it should actually be on that little um, yep. like task bar when you share your screen, but you will see like you might mute your camera. Yes, I might have to unshare and oh, there's our audio settings. Let's see. If you unshare and then reshare, there's a little checkbox at the bottom or that will say share with audio. Share computer sound. There we go. All right. Let's start this over. Okay, class, we're going to do some math problems based on yesterday's homework. I hope you all have been doing your homework. Noemi, we're going to start with you. You're going to tell me what's the answer to five plus one? Six. Okay, great. Good for you. And Nikki, what is three plus two? Five. All right, great job. Nardisha? Can you tell me what's the answer to seven plus two? Disha? Disha, I asked you a question. Disha, that is not the right thing to do. Disha, please put the paper down. Okay, Disha, I want you to come and sit over here for me. This is not acceptable behavior. 
Okay, so okay, so just that really short. We're gonna do some little... math problems based on yes. Okay, so filled out a few of these already for you, but these last few is what I'd like your assistance if you want to drop drops down um, some of your your observations in the chat. So we see that we are in math class with Mrs. Diaz. So what is the antecedent that you noticed before we saw any behavior? Go ahead and drop what you observed in the chat. And I'll look through some of your answers. Anything that you noticed that happened before the behavior? Perfect, the teacher asked for an answer. So the teacher asked our student for an answer um, to this assignment. All right, so what is the behavior that we saw after the teacher asked the math question? So this is the, the behavior that we observed um, that occurred in response to being asked to answer a question. What did you see? Perfect, she started throwing things. So that is our behavior. So what happened after that? What consequence did we see um, happen after she started throwing paper? What did we see happen after she threw the paper? Perfect, she got to go sit over by herself. Um, so what do you think based on that series of events might be the function of her behavior. Why do you think that she threw those papers based off what we saw at the beginning, the behavior we noticed, and then what happened after? So what is our potential function? Escape and avoidance and timeout, perfect. All right. Awesome, everyone. All right, I'll go back real quick. So that's just kind of a really brief example of something that you can do to figure out what is the function of our behavior. So we know what the functions are and trying to figure out which one is it. This is a really simple process to go through and kind of collect some data to see if there's a pattern in what is motivating their behavior. So I will throw this up here. This is all of our contact info, but we can go ahead and open um, the floor up to you for questions. We'll go through and, and see if there's anything we missed up earlier in the chat. Um, oh, it looks like, oh, perfect, Mary. Thank you for jumping in there. I um, mean, our last example, be, it could also be attention. Um, she did get some attention from her teacher, like Mary said, right after she threw the paper. Um, so what we want to do in this situation is have multiple times that we observe um, so that we get multiple examples of, of what is happening and what is happening before and what is happening after. So it's kind of hard to tell just based off of one example because it could be attention and it could be escape. Um, there's good arguments for both. And so by looking at multiple examples, um, of, of behavior, it'll give us a better idea of what could be the function of this behavior. All right. So yeah, if there's any questions that you have specifically about any of our content, feel free to throw that in the chat and Mary and I can um, go ahead and answer some of those questions for you. All right. Thank you, Ashton, Mary. And I think that was like a super interesting yet very uh, useful topic. And just like the examples, um, kind of give, you know, kind of, we know the theory, but it's also helpful to kind of go back to examples um, and connect that theory to practical situations, just because that gives us a better idea. So thank you for presenting on that. And um, like Ashley and Mary said, they have their contact information on here. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions. We will be posting the recording for this presentation on um, our website. As you know, uh, previously, if you have <clears throat> registered for our webinars, any Chong, she does email y'all with the recording uh, and with the feedback form. So look out for that this weekend or early Monday. Um, but right now, I think we're at a good stopping point to take any questions if anyone has. And I know we addressed some questions as we went, uh, but I think if there are any additional questions. Okay. So there's a question right here. Most parents struggle with behaviors related to sensory. While they must meet the child's needs, they also would like to, would like inappropriate behaviors to be replaced. 
Um, I'm not too sure exactly what the question was there, Tarinsi, if you want to maybe elaborate. Um, but let's take the next question. Um, we have to um, sorry. I, Go ahead, I, So, um, So the question here is most parents, uh, I find they are maybe a little bothered by the stimming kind of uh, or the constant movement, which is sort of maybe sensory related. And they, they see the outward behavior and they want to sort of kind of stop that because maybe they're embarrassed or they I mean, sometimes it's socially not in, appropriate. But at the same time, the child needs to sort of do these in order to keep the child regulated. So, and so how do we go about so addressing these sensory needs? Sometimes they have a lot of mouthing, they put stuff in their mouth, which can be dangerous as well. So what would be like sort of a good recommendation we can tell parents how to go about addressing these issues while also you have to meet the child's needs. Like we can find maybe carrots or other things to chew on, but quite often that's the area that we are struggling. Um, I think one point, one uh, topic that's uh, important to know about um, stimulating and sensory seeking behavior is that sometimes they're paired with another function as well. So um, sometimes there will be children who will engage in self injurious behaviors um, and then their parent will say, oh my gosh, stop and talk to them a lot and pay attention to them or they'll give them a task and they'll start hurting themselves or engaging in a stimming behavior. And then the parents will get afraid and then they'll take, take that away. Sometimes those stimming behaviors are reinforced with other functions. So it's important to take data on that and try to consider that as well. Sometimes um, if you if it's if you find that it's attention maintained, sometimes ignoring it might help while also making sure the child is safe, like neutrally taking something out of their mouth or blocking them from being hurt. Um, or if it's escape, um, sometimes um, it's important to keep readministering the demand. I had a feeding case um, one time where the child's behavior was um, he would force himself to throw up um, and where the I instructed the parent to you know, neutrally not be mad, not talk to him a whole lot, clean it up, give him a minute to recover, and then say, okay, please eat this. And then the behavior stopped. Um, so it's important to try to consider that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay. All right, thanks for addressing that, Mary. Um, the next question to what extent can negative reinforcement affect the child and um abiram if you want to maybe elaborate on that question that will be helpful but um we can also just answer this question yeah so um Again, negative reinforcement really depends um, on what exactly. I think it, we can provide more context and more, I mean, we can provide more information if you can give us more context. Um, so essentially negative reinforcement is like you take something, you take away something that the child does not like to do. So if, if homework is something that the child doesn't like to do, you take that away. Um, so, if you think that taking something away that the child doesn't like is actually increasing appropriate behaviors, um, like the behaviors that you want to see in the child, then um, there's really no extent. Um, it's really how you want to kind of manage that um, and apply that. So I can answer more if you can give me an example. Um, well, let's take the next question. Um. I just wanted to add on to that negative reinforcement can be very helpful when you know that the function of the behavior is escape. This escape is negatively reinforced. You're taking away something that's not very pleasant and you're helping the child escape from it. So negative reinforcement can be really helpful for those kiddos. And Binush also entered something. Um, so such behavior can indicate an inner need in the child. So negative behaviors may give us a signal for a crying need in the child. So it is also important to pay attention to that. Yeah, I totally agree. And again, it always comes down to why is the child crying? Is it because the, your child wants attention or your child wants to escape or avoid a task? Um, 
So yeah, or like, does your child need access to something like access to a toy? Uh, and that's why they're crying. And the minute you give that toy, they stop crying. Um, not only toys, like could be candy, could be um, could be TV time, uh, could be to go outside and play with their friends. So it could be a whole lot. A lot of behaviors can be eliminated when we have good connection and good attunement and the people around the child's nonverbal communication is loving. Yeah, it's so important to really read the child's behaviors. Um, it's almost like we have to be really good observers of our child's behaviors and also we need to make sure that we observe the environment. Isn't encouraging children in escape behaviors negative also? So this is an interesting thing. Um, you know, Mary and Ashley talked about replacement behaviors, right? So for example, you as a caregiver or an educator know that the child um, always cries because they want to escape from work. So what you do is you, now that you know that, you tell the child, okay, um, so suppose like escape would be the child um, runs out of the classroom, right? The child runs down the hallway whenever you give them a task to do. So what you can do is you can tell the child, okay, you complete these 10 problems and we can go take a walk down the hallway. We can leave the classroom for five minutes. So essentially you're using that escape in your favor to get the child to do what you want them to do and then using that to reward the child. Let's take a walk outside. So like essentially you're teaching them the replacement behavior. Do this math homework and then let's go outside the class. Let's go walk down the hallway. Um, so in a sense, it is encouraging um, because it gets the child to do that work and also um, gets them to enjoy the reward that they want. The idea behind it is to get them to engage in escape, yes, but to do it in a way that's more appropriate. So um, it's more appropriate to say, may I be excused at the dinner table than it is to just get up and leave. So although they are still escaping, you are still maintaining some control over that behavior and you're getting them to do that in a more appropriate way as an adult. Um, one thing that I'd like to add, um, Chat did this in, in her phrasing of her example of if then. So if you do your homework, then you get to take a break. Um, so we're making sure that that these that these reinforcement, the way that we're reinforcing behavior is that this is our consequence. So when we talked about our antecedent behavior and our consequence, so these things are coming after um, so that we are encouraging kids to first engage in whatever or comply with whatever behavior or, or instructions or tasks that, that we've given you. And then we're gonna reinforce this behavior in whatever way is rewarding like Mary had pointed out um, and that we kind of chatted about is that that structure um, can be really helpful as an if and then. If you do this, then you can receive whatever reward you're working for. Those are all great questions, everyone. Can give it a couple of seconds to see if anyone has any other questions. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, I think you just hit the nail on the head. Like they have to do what they have to engage in whatever kind of work that you expect them to do. Um, and then they can achieve whatever reward that they want. So that's really like first this, like if and then. Um, and also like kind of tying back everything that was discussed today, we need to make sure we reward children the minute that they engage in whatever we want them to do. Um, because what happens is the minute we don't reward, they lose that motivation and it's gonna be so hard for you to get them to repeat those behaviors because they know like, I did this behavior, you promised me this thing, you never gave it to me. Um, so why should I? And I think that's that's normal of like us adults as well. And that applies the same for our kids too. Okay, <clears throat> so with that, 
again, I'm going to drop the link over there. Um, since you all are present here, I want you to be able to um, qualify to enter your name into the raffle draw if you are attending uh, or if you will attend all of our sessions. So uh, do complete that before the end of, uh, before actually um, you all hop off today. But I'm going to quickly share my screen, <clears throat> excuse me, to talk about um, what's coming up next week. Okay. Oops. Okay. So for next week, we have Lauren Martone. Um, oops. All right, there you go. Um, we have Lauren Martone um, talking about what is behavior. So kind of some, somewhat similar to what we spoke about today, but really be focused on uh, functions of behavior reinforcement and punishment procedures. But um, Lauren will kind of look deeper uh, and dig deeper into behavior. So what are behaviors and what are not behaviors? Kind of what Mary touched on in a single slide today. Um, we'll talk about labeling behaviors. We'll talk about defining behaviors. Um, for example, somebody said aggression is a behavior. And when you say aggression, what does it mean? Um, aggression looks different to different children. For some, aggression could be pinching and biting. For others, aggression could be hitting and kicking. So aggression, we can, um, I guess, more further break it down into the different kind, types of aggression that different children present. Um, and we'll also speak about tracking your child's behavior correctly. Um, just like um, Mary and Ashley today uh, pulled out a data sheet and went through an example and kind of walked you all through that, we will speak more about how do we use similar kinds of procedures to really track a child's behavior correctly. So feel free to, um, let me drop the link since you all are here. Feel free to go ahead and register for that. If you have not, I just dropped the link on the chat. Um, <clears throat> and with that, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Sorry, it's not the secrets of parenting. That's what happens when you copy and paste. Um, 